All right, so I'm glad you guys are here. Um, today, I wanted to focus our discussion around uh, making rubrics more audience friendly, student friendly. Um, if you were uh, present at the, uh, the, 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 the workshop, the training that I offered back in February about rubrics and collective marking, uh, we did address that, okay, to a certain extent. Of course, the, the focus was more, how do we make them, uh, how do we make them user-friendly for us and how do we mark accordingly and make them work for us as markers? But I had said I wanted to put the emphasis a little bit on how do we then make them more user-friendly for students? How do we start the year off or our course off with rubrics that make sense to them? And not just what the ministry is, because the ministry is sending us, you know, wonderful tools. Once you, if you understand them correctly, then you're all good. And uh, most teachers do. They sit together, they make sense of them, and then they go with that. But as far as students go, I'm a very, very firm believer in giving those tools to students as we begin. Okay, I've always done so on the uh, on the youth sec in the youth sector, and I believe the same uh, to be true for uh, for uh, adult. And I think that if you give them the rubrics, you also have to make sure that they understand the rubrics and that they are friendly to them so that they can make sense of what's expected of them. Because rubrics to me must serve as formative evaluation tools as much as uh, summative evaluation tools. So that's the idea behind today's, um, today's après cours is to discuss how you do that first and how if anything if I can make uh, if I can make suggestions or help you along uh, with that and of course having taught Emily and uh, and Frank having taught before you also have something I'm sure to say about that yes Frank I was just wondering is this uh, the transformation of rubrics that already exist or creating them from scratch or a you can do either actually okay. you can just go about and that's what I wanted to start with is how do you do it how do teachers do it so that we can then start from that if, if Nancy has a wonderful idea, a wonderful way of using rubrics that she creates herself, then we're going to go from there. But of course, if, uh, if you'd rather start with something that the ministry has already issued and you want to change that, then that's also possible. Can I ask a question? Yes. I know um, sharing rubrics is really important. But in terms, and this is a conversation we had years ago, Frank, when I came in on a workshop to sort of look at some of the original uh, exams and I think it was Ali Lefay said we were not allowed to share the rubrics when we look at our exam booklets the only rubrics are in there are with the footer say evaluation and correction guide which <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm absolutely comfortable in sharing something that actually says that on the label. Now, I also know with different subjects, I think with math and French, the rubrics are actually included in the student workbooks, which then I have no problem sharing. The problem with some of the English ones is actually some of the criteria are tied in to particular questions like question two, you need. To... So it's compromising the exam to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we're also compromising our student success if we can't share those rubrics. I've been sort of getting around it by rewriting them to a certain degree I can, I can on a blank that. piece of paper. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of feel like I'm playing with the rules there. And I don't know what the minister, I mean, Annie LeFay was very clear about that. When we I, took think, I think I can reassure you a bit, but let's see what Frank and Emily have to have to say to that. Yeah, that's a great point, Nancy. I think, um, yeah, for some of the, some subjects, the rubrics are part of the DEB, which are available on the ministry website. So like anybody can go and look at them. But I remember the ones, um, there was like one piece of something for contemporary world that it had like a little piece of like compromising information. So I like whited out that part and wrote in like, you know, something else. Mm -hmm. and shared it with my students back when I was doing that because mm -hmm. um, there was also like a anyway never mind we won't talk about contemporary world but um so that's what I did for those and I see like HEPTA is here HEPTA is from RSB in the ELI 
um, from the ELI world. And Hepta, as far as I know, for the, the courses that we offer, we don't have rubrics associated with a lot of our exams, correct? For the really low, low levels. It's only like from secondary one and above that we have rubrics, I believe. Uh, no, no, no. For the low exams, for all the exams, we have rubrics. Okay. Because I'm teaching Lit 1 now, and uh, there are rubrics. Okay. It's, it's, it's a good um, guideline for marking for the teacher. Mm -hmm. I think my problem with rubrics is, like, I liked the contemporary world rubric because it was associated with the checklist. Yeah. Because otherwise I find the rubrics are just so vague and it's like thorough analysis of whatever. And you're like, okay, but what does that mean compared okay, to exactly. acceptable compared to whatever? Like, exactly. I need examples. Mm -hmm. Yep. And students will ask the same thing. And uh, most teachers want to also do that. And when I remember when we did marking centers, when I was at the youth center, Ooh. which is pretty much the same thing when as when we do collective marking. When we did uh, marking centers, the first half day was spent on, okay, sample papers. What's a three? What's a four? What's a five? Where do you rank this one? A four minus four plus. What's the difference between such and such? And let's look at the rubric together so that once we begin the triad marking, everybody has had that conversation right before beginning and everybody's on the on the same wavelength as far as what does thorough mean and what do we expect from uh what's impressive what's a sophisticated language what's all of that so that is something that is very important that in centers uh or school boards depending on the size and what you want as a structure i think it's very important that there that conversation occurs Mm -hmm. between teachers and I know that some teachers come in you know they are hired the Thursday and start teaching the Monday type of thing and that exists and that's that's one of the things we have to contend with and, and work with and work around but nonetheless there should be a conversation at least between uh, that new teacher coming in and somebody from you know the older guard that says okay let's take a look at the rubrics what we have on hand how we understand and and not just this is how we do it, but rather, do we understand each other? Is there a way that we can uh, work around those very, very vague words sometimes? Uh, sophisticated to me is not the same as sophisticated to you and so on and so forth. Yeah. As far as the rubrics go, um, I do, the way that I work around those uh, issues, Nancy, you were wondering, because in some cases, they are pretty, they're, they're kind of giving away a little bit of what the answer should be or so on. What I do is I really take a look at the rubric and see if the rubric is indicative of anything uh, that is to be done in the exam. Of course, I will then work from scratch and build uh, build a rubric that is, you know, uh, that it that resembles it, that has the same the same objectives to it, if you will. But I will change it enough that there won't be any giveaway in there. When there's a rubric for, let's say, a narrative. Okay, um, personal narrative or uh, um, a response, for example, then I'm going to keep it as is, present it as is, because it's it's a public domain. There's no problem with rubric sharing. Uh, I can reassure you with that. Unless, of course, you see something there that would be indicative of an answer. Of course, then you would keep it uh, keep it on uh, on the on the low side, or change maybe high, uh, white out something, or change the wording around. But I would work from scratch with those and with the ones I have, and go from that for those that are not indicative of too much, or that refer to a uh, a, a type of writing or a response that is a little bit more vague, if you will. If that think, answers your question, I don't actually think it does answer my question. I think we've got a workaround, but what is the ministry line on mm -hmm. us sharing? Because those documents are not in the public domain. I have never been told that the rubrics cannot be shared. But we were, time. we were. Oh. A few years ago, you said? Yes. Is that, is that possible? And she was de very definitive about this. And she agreed with our arguments and our rationale for wanting to share the rubrics, but it was a no. Okay, I will 
quadruple so, check that right, just that to make sure. But from what I know, and I'm very comfortable sharing them in my presentations, I would be very comfortable sharing them with students if I were. And I think there's a difference teacher. between sharing them in presentation form with other teachers. Because we still we have access to those same documents, and Frank, I I'm not making that whole conversation up about what well, and sure and if I, and if I sure. was no, quite, you're not. Back, but there's been a change of uh, attitude and course when it comes to uh, rubrics. Yeah. Uh, I know that, in, for example, as we're talking about now, the rubrics that are for ministry based exams for some of them for math, for example, that yeah. reveal too much of the content. They're not available. Yeah. But uh, there's been, as I said, a, like a 360 complete turnaround on the part of the ministry uh, from pressure, I think, from the boards. This is back when the ELA program had to have the exams uh, with the DED. And by the way, the DED, too, was a bit of a fight that, that initially didn't when you want us to, to, to release the blueprint for the exam. Uh, but now the rubrics are, I mean, even on my website, I see it here for secondary four and five ELA courses, the rubrics are there. Yeah. The challenge now is how to transform those rubrics from teacher language to, to student friendly language, which is something we which is something that's reoccurring. But but at least we have a framework in sec three, four, five. Whereas yeah. HEPTA and ELI teachers uh have no framework for rubrics. No. And there isn't even uh what we call a a gradient learning curve with the ELI curve with the ELI courses. So there's really the wild, wild west a little bit and the and when it comes to rubrics and the ELI. Uh but what what tends to happen at least at our centers is it's exactly what Julie had mentioned. Uh reaching a consensus with the ELI teachers, uh, looking at the exams that they've created and saying, okay, so where are you going with this and how are you communicating to your students throughout the session, how they're going to be evaluated. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I, I just, if if I was still in, in school, I would keep insisting on. And I mean, in my, in my experience, no one would start, this beginning of the year would start with that kind of conversation. Our first department meeting would be would have that as one very important point on the agenda. Let's look at rubrics. Is everybody familiar with, or if anyone's changing from sec two to sec four, let's say, and teaching a different uh, level, are we all comfortable with the language? What's expected? What the tasks are? Uh, so that and that would be one of the things that we'd start the year with. Can I just say a couple? Now, this it may be a dream of dream pipe dream. Is there a possibility that at some point the ministry will? reissue the same exams but document uh, package them up in the way that the rubrics are actually in the public in the students they can have access to it i know that it's been it's been requested okay from them several um, times so i'm one i, I have a, i'm i hope I'm very hopeful that they will keep that in mind and put it into the either the DEDs or the well, some public domain somewhere that it is publicly yeah. uh, publicly shared. Yes, but it's been it's been requested. Several Second times. thing, <laughs> sorry, no, um, okay. It's great to be a department, but my department is me myself is and I. <laughs> yes, you're your own and department. I, that's fine. I'm I'm quite happy working independently. But what would be the biggest advantage for me is actually having exemplars. And I can provide you with that. And I that, can work on that. Because smaller centers like myself, it will take me a lifetime to build up a bank of like non-examples, examples, good examples, which is where I'm looking at. Agreed. Each one of my courses. Because yeah. ideally, I would like my students to mark those yes. using the rubric one very as a nice way degree. of yeah. getting them to understand, okay, this is what a non-example, or this is a very good example, exactly. how would you mark it so they can then use that skill to transfer to their own. Absolutely. I'm, I'm never going to, I will hopefully retire before that ever happens, that okay. I'll be up on my own. <laughs> then let's make a deal. Um because one of the things I was offering was a full day workshop where we would do sample selection and go through rubrics and so on. It's, it hasn't been, uh, it hasn't been, it hasn't become a reality because of time constraints, but I was going to definitely offer that at the beginning of uh, the next school year so that people could join in. But in certain circles, like your own, you're the only circle, we can do that together if you want. I can bring in some samples. And you can't because, of course, your exams, I mean, they must remain vaulted because there's only so many exams going around. So you can't share that. But I do have samples that 
although they're not exactly the same question or the same text, they are the same task. So I have those uh, on hand and I have permission to use them. I've, I've been granted permission uh, by, uh, by former students to use them. And they have been also used at our marking centers uh, provincially. But every year there's a new exam in SEC 5, right? So there's no such thing as anything being vaulted uh, at the youth sector in the sense that there's an exam every year and there's one in July, one in January and one in June. So every year they put together a bank of samples for that exam and they use it at the marketing center. And then it becomes something that we can reuse in classrooms with our students when we look at the rubric because the rubric essentially doesn't change from year to year. Uh, but the exam does. Uh, the text that's used is, is, this, is different and the, the collection of, of documents is different and the theme is different. So at the youth sector, we have one exam a year, sometimes two, sometimes three. At the uh, age sector, we have a bank of one, two, three exams that are being rotated. So we can't let anything out. And that is clearly something we can't do. But I do have backup text and backup responses and backup narratives that we that we could look at if you want. And I could then leave you those and you we could make a little booklet of them and then you'd have something to work with and you could reuse them because they are, if they're a three one year, they're a three the year after, so it's not a big problem. And anyone who is willing to do that in September, I will offer that workshop, but it's gonna be a full day and where we can have longer discussions and look at really like dive in and look at what is uh, whatever level is uh, uh, is problematic or what we want in our booklet. But from this point forward, if you need my help with your own having an, your own uh, sample selection or sample booklet, then we can work on that. We just have to make time for it and we can work on that. I'd be glad to help. Emily. Yeah, I was just fact checking my earlier statement of mm -hmm. DEDs being like the rubrics being part of DEDs. I opened mm -hmm. like a whole bunch and a whole bunch of different subjects. And mm -hmm. I don't think I'm correct about that because I'm not seeing any <laughs> rubrics and DEDs. Maybe I am misremembering and maybe it's just that in like the guide and the student booklet, like you mentioned, Nancy, yeah, that the but rubric there was is part work of that. Done. Before I came in, uh, Isabel Bertolotti had put together a, a, a big reference document using the DEDs and putting together this, okay, so this is going to be done prior to the exam, and this is going to be part of, part one is this, and it, this is how, how many percent. So that's been done before, and if you read the DED, you have a very good idea of what's going to be in there, but the rubrics themselves are in the correction guide. Yeah. It, as far okay. as English goes, yes, that's where they are. It's super interesting, because okay. like in VT there's like laws that clearly say that the student has to know like how mm -hmm. they're being evaluated. And I don't, yep. I haven't read yet too much on the AGE side in, ter in terms of like what documentation, what laws there are for AGE, but. It should be yeah. the same. And, and the, the same. rationale is that it's okay, but things have not been necessarily changed on paper or electronically, but the, the, I think that the, the perspective is different now. Mm -hmm. And there's been quite a turnaround on, on not hiding them anymore. Unless they, of course, unless they give you too much information. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know that a response or that a um, an analysis rubric gives away too much. I mean, you are, you're going through the literary elements as you teach the course, as students read the text and whatever. So when it says uh, perceptive analysis of literary, I mean, there's nothing there that's, a, that's too much of a giveaway. But mm -hmm. we're hopeful. I am very hopeful that they're going to go ahead and change that. They promised they would. <laughs> but then, yes, Nancy. I The one thing I was going to say about the rubrics, and I come across it today. Um, yes, we get the idea of what they're going to be evaluated on and from the DED. But with the 4111, okay. oh, 4113. Okay. It yep. asks on the report that they have a title. Hmm. And because a student doesn't write a title, they are automatically put at the weekend. Mm -hmm. Because uh, even though they've got all the other things, like I think it's paragraphing and whatever, they don't have a title. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an issue with some of the rubrics yeah. that the 
you can say you need this, but there's that, that one little factor that's really fairly insignificant in the big picture mm -hmm. takes away. Like, and I think on the movie reviews, it's the rating. To give, you have to give it a rating. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the idea. That's the idea behind, um, and hopefully that that's going to change as well, is that there is no such thing as, there should be no such thing as percentages in rubrics like that. But of course okay. they do exist and they're there and we have to make do with what we have. But I remember uh, a very, very, uh, a very um, radical change in evaluation when they went from 25% per criterion to no percentage to yep. not all criteria not all criteria must be must be present in the response for the response to be a good one even a 5 in some cases okay so i know that there exists still the percentages and that they read like a checklist so you have in some cases they read like a checklist and you have to go okay so this is missing this is missing this is missing and so that's why i always say look for the good look what's look for what's there give an, give a rating or a, a grade with what you have in front of you not what is missing from the paper itself but of course if it says must have a title and there's no title then you're going to ding them for that and is that fair really is that is it that important? Is it that much of a big of an issue when everything else is done right and the students did understand what they were what they were supposed to do and so on? And if I may pull out the actual rubric that Nancy was referring to, as I have it right here, I'm going to share it with you. Please tell me if you see it. It's the 4113, and this is the news report. Is that what you were referring to, Nancy? Appropriate use of structures, features, codes, and conventions, and yeah. then you see the title there. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So she had multiple. She had several quotes or statistics in it. Mm -hmm. She had great paragraphing, mm -hmm. but she did have didn't have a title. Mm -hmm. Right. So automatically, it goes into that very weak category. Well, that's the thing. That's where I would I would disagree with that. But then there's... it's written down there. You how can you disagree? I, with I, I, yes, I know what you mean. But if and 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 we can, of course, I don't want to take too much time and and hijack the conversation with with my 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 uh, my understanding of it or my interpretation of what's missing versus what's there. But there are many. Uh, I mean, there are more things. I mean, when you see excellent paragraphing, what does that, I mean, that's even vague, right? Oh, yeah. Excellent paragraphing is very vague. Two relevant statistics and or quotes and or references, that's very precise. Title is very precise. Of course, a news report, you will expect it, you'll expect there to be a title. I agree with you. Uh, in the response, you don't have to write a title. And some students really get... Uh, hung up on putting a title there when they really don't have to because they're responding to text. So when there is, it's a structure or feature or a code or, or convention of yeah. text agreed. However, in that same box, you have very precise and, un, and, and a very imprecise or very vague element that you have to evaluate. And in my book, the paragraphing should be, I mean, it should it's overtake- it's more important, else, you know? it's it's more important than the title and that backing up yourself with the statistics or the quotes is more important. And it's part of the paragraphing. Yeah. If you look at it from that standpoint, if you do an excellent paragraph, write an excellent paragraph, you'll have an excellent topic sentence, you'll have support for your ideas. And then if it says you need to have two, then good for you, you have two. But there, there needs to be two for the whole news report. But then each paragraph must be looked at for a paragraph. So it's, I mean, the rubrics are, they're never going to be perfect, mind oh. you. But definitely there's an issue there. So that's why I say, okay, let's start, let's see what's good. Let's see what's there. And yes, if a title is missing, obviously you have to, you know, you have to make that count. But are you definitely, are you going to go from a very good paragraphing to a weak 3.3 objective because of the title if everything is else is there i would you, tend to disagree with that because that's, I, what you, that's the your rubric title. you're using and it doesn't it's very obvious it doesn't have a title yeah but if you want if somebody asked you nancy why did you not 
why did you not lower the grade to a very weak if the title was missing and you had everything else, you would definitely be able to show your professional judgment and say, look, everything else is awesome about this. That yeah. title is missing. The student's been, you know, th there were points deducted for that because you don't have to give that student a, a 10, but you don't have to lower it down to a two just because the title is an element that's very important. But if everything else is there, look for the good. And yes, whatever's missing, then a student can't have a perfect score. But I'm sure you would have no problem with your professional judgment, arguing the fact that the student did everything else right. And in that box, there were other things to evaluate. The so, problem is, is with that rubric design, because mm -hmm. you're actually evaluating three things in one, one criteria. And they well, don't what you should same. have done is actually had that 10 marks divided over the three. Absolutely. So yes, you can get do excellent on one of them and mess up on one, but it's not going to impact. So there is an issue with these rubrics designs. Absolutely. Because you're there evaluating are. Yep. more than one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. Yep. But let's say you wanted to uh, to try and avoid that that problem or try to find a way around that problem. And if there were more than just you in that in that situation if there were two or three teachers that sat together at the beginning of the term or the year or whatever and said okay so what do we do about that 3.3 what do we consider excellent paragraphing and come up with you know your your uh perspective on excellent paragraphing and uh okay there must be two relevant statistics in the whole uh and what do we do about the title missing and the understanding is there then not just your professional judgment, but the team's professional judgment is, is there to back up whatever you do with that title missing. And a rubric is meant to be interpreted, right? So you can always argue, well, that's the way that we interpret it. And we think that the title is important enough, but not, you know, so important that the student should fail uh, and, and lose eight points out of 10 for that particular, for that reason. And that could be something you do with your team, sit together, decide, and then go, okay, title is important. Let's decide what we do if it's missing. And of course you will reinforce that it's supposed to be there because that's what you're gonna teach. But if it does, if it is missing, does the student deserve a two out of 10? Well, you can make that, that call and you and your teammates can make that call and you can have a, a, a ped consultant in there so that everybody can support each other in saying, we believe, we have our professional judgment, we call for this as being, uh, what this is what we're going to do if it's missing, let's say. Or this is what we, we, we think constitutes an excellent paragraph, because it's not there. Definitely not precise enough. So what do we consider if, if there is no topic sentence? then that's an, an important part of paragraphing or that there should be one idea for. So all of those things become something that you must really discuss with your team. Of course, if you do have a team, sorry, Nancy. Or with us, Nancy, as you're doing here today. But absolutely, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, that the way, the way it shows up here, no title. And I mean, we have to also bear in mind that 3.3 is worth 10%, and yeah. not 15 or 20%. Mm -hmm. And if I can give you some background into some of the battles that took place, because I was one of the authors mm -hmm. of this rubric back in 2008 or nine, mm -hmm. uh, the mindset that was at the ministry at that time, Nancy, that we were fighting against, mm -hmm. one was not to make this transparent, which was a huge victory. Second one was, I mean, when it came to something like spelling, they wanted to be, if you had made the same spelling mistake several times in an ELA exam, they wanted marks deducted for that. Mm -hmm. And I said, but that's purely punitive way of assessing and evaluating uh, just like the no title is here. So that consensus reaching, and, and also you have to think is who's challenging you. So students, as I, I, from what I understand and what I see are becoming increasingly uh, demanding and sophisticated and knowing how they're being evaluated. Mm -hmm. And and, and Hepti also, I'm sure you're experiencing this in ELI. Uh, they want to know how they're being evaluated and how you communicate that evaluation throughout, this, throughout the session. So if I'm being an ELA teacher and I know they're writing a report, Darn right, I'm going to stress that title all the time. And it's not cheating in any way, shape, or form. But if the, the student forgets to put in the title, by all means, I don't, I don't everything else is, is, can't be discounted that you said here. So that consensus reaching is really important. And I can pretty much guarantee you, no administrator, no one from in the, admin, the ministry is going to come down on you and say, well, you know, there's no title here. You had to give it a two. Uh, defending your, 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 your marks is a way of defending it if it's already, your rubric has already been shared with your students and how you're going to be applying it, which mm -hmm. is kind of lacking in the LI. Like, that's why I said it's kind of more ambiguous there. 
Mm -hmm. And rubrics were made by, you know, they were made by professionals. And most of the times there were teachers involved and PED consultants involved and uh, experts at writing programs involved. So everybody put in their very best in there. But as we go and as we use them, we discover little things here and there that we think could be improved, like going from 25% for each block to no percentage, just a, you know, a score. And even some things can be missing. Uh, for example, connections in a response. If you have no connection and you write one, you force yourself to put a connection down and it's an awful one, you lose a quarter of your mark. So over year, over the years, they have made those changes, but it's nothing to say that they were not done well in, when they were uh, done at the, at the onset. I mean, everybody was working from their very best uh, understanding of rubrics could, should be. And remember, we used to have very different types of texts and transactionals and all that creative writing just a few years back. So this is not to say that they are awful, but they are definitely perfectable. All right. I think you're right. I think anything that we use until you use it and actually take it off that paper form format, you will always find something that's like, oh, it worked in my head, but in reality, it didn't work or in reality, it needs to be tweaked. So mm -hmm. it's just that I, I find and also, our, I think our understanding of rubrics has evolved as teachers. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. As we've used them more, um, maybe we're becoming more picky about our rubrics. Possibly, but we're better at it too. Yeah, because we are better at it. And mm -hmm. what looks good, what looked good six or seven or eight years ago, yeah. mm -hmm. now that we've used them, we've got used to different rubrics. We're actually saying, okay, this rubric, there is room that it mm -hmm. needs to be there needs to be even in the best and most recent ones there's always wiggle room there needs to be room for your professional judgment especially in when you're using rubrics because rubrics are not object they are subjective tools they're not objective tools uh, if you have an equation in math and there's only one way of doing even in math they have rubrics and they have show your work and you're going to get marks for your steps and so on sorry hepta your hand was up earlier and then yeah disappeared and i just wanted to again. say taking me back to my days when i taught yele i just wanted to say interpreting the, the the rubrics at times can be challenging but in terms of um this specific rubric that we were discussing mm -hmm. if there isn't a title i would hope um, uh, the corrector could see there's a common thread throughout the paragraphs that connect these paragraphs to some idea that the that the um, the invigilator can deduce that this um, student is writing about. Exactly. I mean, there's a structure to the text you're writing, yeah. either linear, or circular, or whatever you want. But you're absolutely right. If the if everybody everything is well constructed, if the structure is is illogical and it, it flows and everything's yeah. clear and there's a title missing, well, yeah. okay, it, it's missing and it's in the rubric. Does that take everything away from a very good all the way down to a weak? And I don't know that that's even though it's only ten points, it's ten percent. Well, it's that, I mean, those, those marks, those grades are important and they're not to be taken lightly in that sense. If we're going to remove eight points for a title missing and everything else being structured and well, and well done, then I don't know that we're really doing, I mean, the professional judgment has to be, and, and as Frank said, no one's going to come and, you know, give you a slap on the back of the hand. So you did not evaluate this properly. You can always back it up with your professional judgment. I'm absolutely sure of that. I have no doubt that you would do the right thing if you were given that student a mark that was uh, even a passing or a, a you know fairly high mark, even with that title missing, for example. So those are places where you have to trust yourselves. I mean, you are professionals, you know what you're doing, teaching and grading and, and uh, evaluating students is, is an art in itself. And if you haven't done it for a while, uh, sometimes you'll just think of technicalities, but you're dealing with individuals. So. so I would not worry too much about that. I would definitely uh, exercise my professional judgment, that judgment on that one.
and having sample papers would help very, very much. Like, I guess you could always write on the student's sheet on the rubric. There's like a space for comments, right? And then you can just write down that justification so that you can remember if anything were contested later, but I agree it probably wouldn't be. I think it just feels like higher stakes when it's one of those ministry exams versus mm -hmm. one of the ones that like at the different level and you're like nobody's yes. really checking this one that's okay like it's for sec three credits which doesn't contribute to the diploma it feels it's different like word count students five. ask do i have to write six don't count your words come on do you think they have time when they when they do marking centers no one's counting words this is a ballpark figure we're giving you an idea of what but i mean if you have 590 and not six six hundred I mean, but they do think, oh, this is a high stakes exam and I don't want to fail this and so on. And especially when you can't give the exam back, you have to keep traces of what you had to say because students come in and want to know those sheets are awesome. And I used to never write on actual student exams. I always had copies of the rubric. I was awful with paper because I would make photocopies out the wazoo. But nonetheless, I would have a copy of the rubric and I would insert it. And that's where I would highlight and grade and write my comments. So that there's, if there's a reread, no one can be, uh, can be swayed into whatever I thought at the time. And when we do marking centers, keeping trace of what you had to, what you saw and what you thought was there or whatever, then when you discuss as a triad and you're fighting over a three or a four, well, you need to have your backup. So you have your comments there that can be, it can be helpful there. Later, if the student wants to know what, what went on, if you wanna readdress it with a colleague because you wanna look at rubrics once more, those are always going to be useful. And I wish you leave it, the, the deviation was between a three and four. Sometimes it's larger than it's that. It's very and that's difficult, where, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. one of the publications of the ministry I put out a while ago, and I can't find it online anymore. I'm not sure if anyone, but this is, if, if you ever see this, it's, it's a basically, a, it's a common vision of evaluation of learning. And right at the center of it, you have student success. And I kept going back to the ministry publication when it was time to defend why we did the rubrics in such a way. So I said, okay, you're talking about justice and openness. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean? Exactly. Right? You're talking about equity and rigor and equality. Equality means access to it, uh, exactly. the way it's presented. So, I mean, I, I just can't find it anymore, but it's a lovely publication. Can you, you said common vision of what? Because I can't see. A common vision of evaluation of learning. Eval of learning. Okay, I'll look for it. No and they had problem. published a whole bunch of these. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of still with the paper format that we were back in 2007 or eight when this was but published. This is yet a very good, still a very good tool. Mm -hmm. Because that's right there. Your professional judgment is right there. It's in print. <laughs> what openness and whatever, it, it's all there. Mm. Yep. And it really boils down to trusting your trusting your judgment. Because it's really, it's all about that. So I would not worry about sharing the rubrics with your students. Uh, of course, if you see anything that's too indicative of what's going to be in the exam, then obviously, uh, obviously you leave that out or you can white it out or rewrite it or just, you know, not use that particular criterion. But most of what's out there, uh, even if it's not in the program or the DED, uh, I would not worry anymore with, uh, with sharing that. Not worry at all. Otherwise, I would never have said Guys, start with that and at the beginning of this of your of your course, share it with your students and make it into a student friendly version and and using samples is really good because, as you said, Nancy, if you have your students, if you wanted to have your students grade those samples, they're one of the best ways to come up with an understanding of the rubric and what's what's on there and how to work around, a, you know, such a tool because it can be very it, it's, it can be very daunting to look at it and go, oh my God, what, what are they going to do with that when I write my, but when you show it early and you decipher, okay, so what does it mean to be perceptive and what does it mean to be, uh, what's thorough, what does that mean and how can you tell that somebody's been thorough in their addressing a point or another. So that is something that you're not, you're doing your students a disservice if you are not giving them that opportunity to understand the rubric properly. And I would not be afraid anymore if I were you. For ELA anyway, I wouldn't worry about it. 
ELI, there might be some places where there may be too much information, but it's really just a few little things. So I love those conversations. This is this is awesome. I'm I'm so happy uh, those are coming from you. And that's kind oh, of the reason you. why I thank I've, you, Richard. Thank, thank you. you, Richard. Super. Ah, je l'ai trouvé, parfait. Uh, so I couldn't find the publication date for that, but um, when I think of my high school and yeah, right up into CJP University, I don't think I saw one rubric. So that's why I kind of wrote that in a, in a very tongue-in-cheek manner in the, in the chat, that it is the evolution of evaluation. So now that we're looking more closely at it, it's only normal that more things come out, things to be re reached as a consensus, things to be negotiated, how we present this to students, choosing when also to integrate rubrics into your is a, is a, is a scientific art <laughs> in and of itself. Uh, some students yeah. can be immediately intimidated if you do it right from the start, so from the first couple of days when you still haven't quite gelled. So, um, so one of the teachers said to me once, and she was uh, quite astute, she said, well, the only time I introduce a rubric is, only, is when they have a task to perform. So I only introduce it when needed. Uh, but for ELA and higher stakes, some students start demanding it right away. Mm -hmm. And the first week, what's that? What's the exam going to look like? Yeah. Uh, what am I? What am I supposed to be prepared for? Mm -hmm. And what are you going to do? You're not going to deny them that. That's no. you're going to incorporate it into your lessons. Mm -hmm. Yes, Nancy. I, I'm going along on the same lines that Sranka has. I I share rubrics in an adapted form with mm -hmm. my students, but I also adapt them even more because I have in a corner. They've got the weak, good, whatever, whatever, and then have questions to ask yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. did you include a hook? Yeah. Did you include? So mm. each one of those sort of criteria is like a little mini. Did you think about this? Did as I'm starting to, I haven't done it for all the courses because I got that's a work in progress. Because we we talk about having a good paragraph, so. Let's again, have you used transitional words? Exactly. And does and, it have a main and that idea? It can become a checklist for the student. And but it can and be a checklist to evaluate them once you're in front of the exam. But, no, as a but student, it's a stepping stone. You've done everything. Yeah. It's a stepping stone. So they're never actually really going to, if you give a version of that uh, evaluation of learning rubric to them. Yeah. Let's be honest, the language it's used is not very appropriate for young people. No, young. absolutely not. So no, if we. If we are editing it, we can edit it any way we want. Absolutely. As long as it swallows the spirit of that final evaluation rubric. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. And, and then what I'm doing now is I'm, I have course outlines, which I give to students. Mm -hmm. That's a prescribed format, which is one thing. But then also it's I can statements and the I can statements are tied into the rubric. Absolutely. So and there can be you can have a column. In the student rubric, you can have the actual rubric, as you were saying earlier, and an extra column where you have a checklist for each of the criteria. If you well, want. I, I, I just put it down as key questions. Have yeah. you uh, have you questions to ask yourself? Or I can statements, or I have statements. Huh? See, I, I have included a title. I have. Yeah. Uh, I have. Uh, I have one idea per paragraph. Whatever you can yeah. put that into, and then in the summative, of course, you can't. Yeah, but as formative, that's what you want. You want them to get better at it. Thinking about what they've done. Absolutely, absolutely. And writing is not something that, well, most of the time when it's academic, it's not something that you just do one draft of. I mean, when you respond, it's different, but when you have time for, and albeit you don't have much time because you'd like to have more, but when you have time for a rough and editing and revising, well, that's what you make you you have to get them into that habit of reread what you, you know, read over what you've written, look at what's you know what might be missing, do peer editing if needed, if you have time, if there's such an an, an organization, if you have that that uh, in your class. And if we're brutally honest, none of us are throwing our students straight into writing a movie review and not having them practice the movie review writing before Hopefully they go to the not. final exam. Hopefully and so not. that's where they get to use that rubric. Yes, as a formative, absolutely, absolutely. Because, I mean, we wouldn't and, do that. And this is, Nancy, you nailed it right there. When we were defending, including some of the tasks in the rubric, 
and people were uh, at the ministry at the time saying, well, now the student knows what the task is. And I said, are we evaluating their ability to write a film review or are we evaluating their ability to write a surprise film review? Why? Absolutely. Yeah. Why? And almost, every, almost everything we do in life is predicated upon a plan. And we give it some thought. Mm -hmm. And we want thrusting, them to be thrusting, a, thrusting, a, yes, a task at a student that hasn't been thought through is essentially yeah. goes against the value that they've proposed of openness. Absolutely. So what the, how we argued was, what do you mean by openness? We're being open with students. Yeah, you have to write a film mm -hmm. review. Let's read yeah. a whole bunch of them. Here's one that was badly written because, of course, you can find models of both extremes now in the on the Internet. It's easy to do so. And what are you going to do when the student comes up to you and says, how can I make this better as a formative task? Sitting next to you and going, okay, and you go, well, read the rubric. No, you're going to go over with them and you're going to point, point out a few things or ask a few guiding questions. Did you look at everything that you had to put into that text or what is it that, what was the task again? Well, it was a movie review. Okay, so what does that say to you? What does that task say to you well I, I need to go over things that I noticed and good okay have you done that so you guide them with your questions and that's formative evaluation right there so if you don't have your rubric with you or a form of rubric based on the evaluation as Frank said the surprise evaluation rubric uh I mean you're not doing you're, you're not being fair to them you're not uh, and and there are many different ways of of putting together student friendly rubrics. I mean, I know I've shown a few in my in my presentation, but I mean, what Nancy was suggesting earlier, take the rubric, add a column to it as the formative uh, format and remove it once it's it's time for the exam and have the sit downs, the one on ones or the peer evaluation if you have enough students to do so. And I mean, the, and the sample papers are, of course, an extremely, extremely important tool to have, very valuable tool to have. And they don't need to be changed every year because a sample of a three or a three plus or a four minus. And I mean, you need those samples for two minus and three and three, two plus and three minus. Huh? Are you passing them? Huh? Is this a pass? Oh my God. Or going from a three to a four, those are, you know, very useful. So again, if you need my help, if you need, to do any of that, I will gladly set up something uh, earlier if you need to, but I, I am planning it for the fall. And some of the uh, hepta again with ELI with the lower level students, it becomes really difficult how to communicate how they're being evaluated. And yeah. some, mm -hmm. I mean, at the really lower level, that's why some of those I can statements helped out. They and even, even putting some kind of, at the very basis, especially we have students at basic literacy, even in their own languages, emojis end up becoming a bit of yeah. a, <laughs> a yeah. bit of a, a go-to from time to time. But at least for the first few courses, what we've encouraged teachers to, to include in their rubrics when they're making it is the global understanding of the text that the student has written. And not to hone in on the on the trees for lacking of the forest, because if the student has managed to communicate their intent in an ELI course, that's half the grade right there. Mm -hmm. And then said, OK, now deviate from that and start looking at the, the grammar, the pronunciation and the rest of it. Yeah. So I'm not sure if this is encouraging to you, Hepta, but you have. No, kind no, of no, a, it's very it's very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I really I really think that. Um, Teachers need to have this conversation at the beginning of the year or the semester, but the conversation must be had because uh, many times interpreting the rubrics can be challenging. Exactly. And that's something that you can call, you can call upon me to come in and, and you know, mm -hmm. just join in that conversation and, and maybe, you know, if need be, redirect a few things or, or encourage people to do things that, you know, do require their judgment, but they're not be afraid of that judgment. I mean, mm -hmm. you can back up what you're, what you're saying about a, a student piece. I'm not worried about that at all, but I mean, mm -hmm. this definitely I can, I can be of help. If you should ever need my help, let me know. Mm -hmm. And what I find, it doesn't matter how experienced you are as a teacher, no. as you move from course to course and the rubrics change, they come with their own challenges. Absolutely. And yeah. math and science have their rubrics right now. Yeah. And they're, they did not exist 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. 
So, I mean, it, it, everything is in progress. Everything is progressing. So we have to keep up and we have to help each other keep up. Yep. So if we can, then why not? Why not use one another? Uh, it's not about, because sometimes people will feel that, well, if, if I ask for help, I'm kind of admitting that I'm not very good at it. No, it is a vulnerability factor. There is one there. I mean, you have to, you have, to have that vulnerability to say, look, I need, I need a little bit of help here. But it's simply because things are changing so fast. It's not about you as a person and what you do and what you understand. It's about what do I do with the new way of handling certain things so it's not at all about it's not personal it's it's functional and if we do not function the same way in our centers in our schools then we're going to have those conversations and they're going to be frustrating conversations down the line whereas they can be very uh fruitful conversations they can then direct everybody along the same lines and everybody can be heard and we can go from there so I don't want to take you, uh, I don't want to keep you longer than was that we were supposed to. Um, I'm glad we had conversations instead of going through, you know, a set of slides and, and me yeah. showing you how I do my stuff. I'm, I think this is much richer uh, when we do it this way. So I'm very happy that you joined in, Hepta and Nancy. And okay. please don't hesitate. Let me know if I can be of any help putting together sample selections, uh, helping you out with your, with your team or even one-on-one. -on -one. I am just a team call away. Okay, thank you.